welcome to our uh, talk today. Today I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Sergei Plakhanov, who is an associate professor in the Department of Public, uh, Political Science at York, York University in Toronto, Canada, where he teaches international comparative politics. He holds a BA and an MA in international relations from Moscow State Institute of International Relations and a PhD in history from the Institute for the Study of U.S. and Canada Academy of Sciences of the USSR. Uh, since his arrival uh, in uh, Canada in 1993, he has been a frequent commentator on Russian and East European affairs for Canadian TV, uh, radio networks, print media, uh, and he also served as Soviet affairs consultant with CBS News. Um, he has consulted uh, uh, with the Canadian and U.S. governments on Russian affairs and has testified at hearings at the Parliament of Canada and the U.S. Congress. Uh, Professor Pilkhanov has published widely on issues of post-communist transformations in Russia, Russian foreign policy, U.S.-Russian relations, and American politics. Uh, today, as a scholar, consultant, lecturer, media commentator, and peace advocate, he is known for his unique ability to explain Russia to Americans and hopefully today to explain a little bit about Ukraine as well. <laughs> um, however, you know, to the students here at UC Irvine, uh, Professor Plakhanov has actually been a lot more than all of these things I have read about because for many years the Russian program here at UC Irvine, uh, which is now housed at the, uh, as part of European Languages and Studies, has really struggled to have enough courses uh, for uh, for our students, especially over the last few decades. And Sergei Prokhanov has been really an integral part of the Russian minor here, even if you haven't known it, because <laughs> his summer classes have been incredibly popular uh, among our students. Uh, they always, uh, and our students are incredibly thankful uh, for the courses he has brought them over the years. I know because every September they come back to my class and all they do is talk about your class. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the title of his talk today is Not a Zero Sum Game, U.S.-Russian Relations in a Multipolar World. So please welcome our speaker today. Thank you very much, Laura. It's always great to revisit Irvine. And I must say that in my own career, the name of this university, UC Irvine, is associated with the end of the Cold War because it was here that uh, uh, one of those many conferences which ultimately resulted in a negotiated end of the Cold War took place back in 1988. That's when I met John Whiteley, uh, uh, Keith Nelson, later Pat Morgan, uh, Michael Hirsch, and many wonderful people, colleagues, members of the community. Uh, and the fact that I discovered UCI at that wonderful moment in history when the Cold War was coming to an end and a new post-Cold War world with so many wonderful opportunities and uh, uh, with much reduced danger of serious conflict uh, was taking place. So uh, <laughs> it is a bit odd. Uh, to be here today when uh, uh, to many people it seems like the Cold War is returning and at least the U.S.-Russian relations are uh, at a stage where competition and conflict seem to be uh, more prominent than cooperation. Uh, but having observed uh, the politics of the Cold War and U.S.-Russian relations uh, in the period of the Cold War, uh, I actually I started uh, systematically examining this relationship almost 50 years ago. Uh, so I've been around for a long time, like uh, my colleagues here, <laughs> and they've observed those ups and downs. And I must say that there's always been, to me at least, uh, something fundamentally confusing and or puzzling and frustrating about the relations between these two states. I mean. They're never really uh, friendly, and they're never really on the brink of war. Those relations have always contained elements of cooperation and conflict. And the elements of cooperation and conflict have always been uh, interwoven in lots of combinations which are difficult to understand, sometimes difficult to understand. And it seems that every time the relationship would go to one extreme of being very friendly and resolving all the issues that existed that 
almost by the force of gravity, there would be a swing toward uh, growing tensions, uh, competition, and then conflict. And then when it goes very far in the direction of the conflict, something would happen and the force of gravity would take the relationship back to a normal, uh, more normal stage. Uh, th there's really, so uh, uh, for practitioners uh, of foreign policy, both in the Russian foreign policy establishment and the, in the American foreign policy, uh, foreign policy establishment, those frustrations have always uh, be, have also been felt. And uh, uh, maintaining that relationship on an even keel, preventing both sides from making mistakes which could be absolutely prohibitive in terms of their consequences has been much of the art of diplomacy between, between the two sides. So what I'd like to do today is try and uh, unravel some of those complexities. First of all, accept the complexity. Accept the fact that at any given moment, relations between Russia and the United States contain elements of competition and cooperation, or conflict and cooperation, at every given moment. So uh, what is the meaning of that? What is the logic? of that uh, dialectical uh, contradiction between cooperation and conflict in relation between uh, Russia and the United States. Why have Russia and, and America cooperated in the two century history of their relations? Uh, what were the interests involved? Why have they competed and sometimes come to loggerheads? What were the interests involved in that? Those are the questions which uh, need to be uh, discussed, and I'd like to uh, at least scratch some surface uh, on, on this uh, very important topic. In fact, what we've seen uh, in the past several months is another illustration of this fundamentally ambivalent and contradictory nature of US-Russian relations, because uh, Ukraine, when Ukraine exploded, and that's what it was, uh, and this explosion continues, uh, Russia and the United States found themselves at the opposite sides uh, of the struggle for Ukraine. And uh, we've watched for several months the actions uh, of Russia and the actions of the United States, uh, supported part of the time by the European allies, uh, trying to cope with this rapidly changing and highly volatile situation in Ukraine. And, uh, uh, because the political uh, fight in Washington is most of the time not about uh, you know, Russians versus Americans, but about Democrats versus Republicans. Uh, of course, the Republicans uh, have uh, lost no time uh, uh, attacking the Obama administration for supposedly being too soft uh, on the Russians. Uh, and in Russia, where there is also a political spectrum between the hardliners and the moderates, you've also seen hardliners calling for you know, greater confrontation with the United States uh, and uh, uh, acting without actually thinking uh, of the consequences of those actions in terms of U.S.-Russian relations. Uh, so uh, the whole European, uh, the whole Ukrainian crisis has been both an interesting test of the relations between Russia and the United States and, uh, and a case study of what's the importance of those relations in the 21st century post-Cold War world? Where are they going? How important are they? You know, in the Cold War, we, were, we had this simplified uh, paradigm of two superpowers who supposedly, so the whole meaning of the Cold War was just whether one superpower or the other will hold an upper hand. By the way, in reality, that was not what was happening. And I'll spend some time on uh, trying to explain why it is so. But of course the Cold War was much more complex than that and the, most of the time it was not about whether it would be Russia or America that would control the world. Uh, but uh, the, the, the zero-sum game uh, relationship seemed to embrace the entire fabric of world politics. Today after the Cold War is over, uh, is that relationship is still the most important bilateral relationship in the world? Or maybe relations between the US and, and China is today more important than relationship between Russia and the United States. How important is this axis between Moscow and Washington among many axes of the increasingly multipolar and very volatile world system which is undergoing a transition 
if I, I, at any given moment I'm stuck with a question, do we have more of a world order or more of a world disorder? <laughs> but this has been the question also during the Cold War. It is easy to picture the Cold War as a form of world disorder, but it was not. It was a, a world system which contained elements of both cooperation and competition, which generated tremendous amounts of social, political, and economic and technological change. Uh, but uh, it was uh, definitely it was definitely something that. Uh, this did not, could not be reduced, uh, could not be reduced to, to this mortal combat between Russia and America. It is interesting that uh, in the first century of their relations, Russia and the United States had a very friendly uh, relationship. Uh, they were far away from each other. America was a rather insignificant player on the global stage, whereas Russia was uh, the world's biggest state already, uh, a mighty empire straddling Eurasia and involved in great power politics big time. So in the 19th century, despite the fact that ideologically they were absolute opposites, this autocratic imperial state ruled by, by the Tsar, who not only controlled but owned everything in, in his vast realm, and on the other side, a scrappy little republic uh, based on principles which were antithetical to the principles on which Russia was based. And yet, despite that ideological incompatibility, they found themselves cooperating. In fact, Russia, people tend to forget that the Russian Empire was helpful to the revolution on the American continent. King George, uh, unable to, to, to uh, control uh, the rebellion or to defeat the rebellion, in desperation turned to the Russian Empress uh, asking her to send uh, something like 50,000 good Russian grenadiers to North America to, to fight off these pesky rebels. And uh, Catherine the Great refused. Uh, she thought that uh, but, uh, the troops could be more useful closer to home. And besides, uh, besides, King George did not come across as a trustworthy or nice kind of a gentleman, so uh, she didn't do that. What she did do was uh, pioneer something interesting in the history of international law, armed neutrality. Because Britain was trying to blockade the American Republic, struggling to survive. And uh, uh, as part of that blockade, the uh, merchant ships uh, uh, taking goods back and forth between Russia and, uh, and the United States, as well as the, between other European countries uh, and, and the United States, uh, were routinely captured and uh, uh, preyed upon. So Russia, <laughs> together with a few other European states, uh, declared uh, a regime of armed neutrality. Uh, the essence was, if you are not involved in a war taking place somewhere, then you might just as well uh, see your ships uh, uh, pass through international waters at peace and not, not to be preyed upon by one of the warring signs. Uh, and uh, in order to make sure that this principle stands, Russia and a few other states, like Denmark, Sweden, uh, uh, they, they sent actually armed ships to, to protect the waterways which contributed, of course, to the failure of the British blockade and helped indirectly uh, or to some extent directly the, the cause of the American rebels. Now, again, it was not because Catherine loved uh, the, you know, we the people and in the course of these events and so on and so forth. No. In fact, that's what George, King George, thought. Hey, you know, you have rebels in your own country. And these guys over there who are challenging the legitimate, my legitimate authority are even more dangerous. Uh, still, geopolitics, <laughs> real politic, and minding your national interests apparently held sway. In the Civil War, the Russians, uh, again, uh, used their ships to help the Americans because they stationed uh, 12 uh, battleships, uh, warships, I, I should say, frigates mostly, uh, in the Atlantic and in the Pacific to uh, serve uh, notice on the British and the French that any intervention uh, in the Civil War in the United States, which was a possibility, but it was being considered both in London and in Paris, would be 
uh, met with the, the presence, the Russian military presence. In fact, the admirals commanding those naval squadrons had uh, orders in case uh, there's direct engagement between the forces, the Union forces, and British or French forces, then the Russian ships uh, must uh, submit to the command of the, of the U.S. government, so to become part of the, of the U.S. Navy. Uh, and again, symbolic significance of that was that even though Russia was minding its own interests, <laughs> Russia was afraid that its own ships might actually be stuck in the Baltic Sea where uh, there was a possibility of a British blockade of the Russian Navy. So taking them out and you know, positioning them at the American shores, helping the Americans, helping themselves in the process. Uh, the first conflict, between serious conflict between Russia and the United States, took place as a result of earth-shaking events of 1917. In 1917, the Russian Empire collapsed under the weight of uh, participation in World War I. And in 1917, partly because Russia collapsed, the United States decided to enter the First World War. So both countries suddenly were catapulted to world roles, but very different world roles. Because at the end of 1917, the Russian Communist Party took power, proclaiming uh, that they are staging a communist revolution or socialist revolution in Russia, viewing it as the beginning of a global revolutionary process that would be followed by other revolutions. Germany was a particularly important place where they were expecting a revolution. Whereas the United States stepped into the fray with a plan to create a post-war world order that would make such terrible wars as World War I less likely. So you had here two visions. One vision, a world in, fl in, in the flames of a world revolution which would overthrow capitalism. On the other side, from the American side, there is a vision of a world which is based on democracy, a right of nations to self-determination, primacy of international law, and an international organization to keep the peace. Of course, there was an ideological conflict there. President Wilson, who pioneered this, uh, this initiative uh, on the American side, making America a, a very important global power, because nobody else uh, was proposing such a system for the world. And nobody else but Russia was proposing <laughs> that a world revolution is beginning. So a degree of zero-sum game. And what's more, because the Bolsheviks, the communists, took Russia out of the fighting of World War I. Uh, that created huge problems for the Allies, so part of the uh, resentment at what was happening in Russia that was felt in all Allied capitals, London, Paris, uh, Washington, was that you know, this trouble in Russia and this uh, taking Russia out of the war uh, might actually tip the balance of the war in favor of the Germans and their allies. And so intervention in Russia, sending troops to Russia, was partly motivated by uh, the considerations of bringing the war to a victorious end. Once the war ended, the rationale for intervention uh, also evaporated. Uh, even though the ideological confrontation remained, there was little love lost between leaders of Western powers and, and the Russian communist government. So. Uh, you can see here that when geopolitical interests and ideological considerations coincide in the relationship between Russia and the United States, you're likely to see that relationship gravitated, gravitating toward some form of conflict. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, following a few years of Russian civil war, even though diplomatic relations were broken between Russia and the United States, uh, the enmity between them kind of evaporated because uh, the world revolution did not occur, so Russia did not look such, as such a dangerous state uh, starting with 1920. And on the other side, Wilson was actually defeated at home. The League of Nations was, not, Nations was not ratified. The idea of new world order was not popular in the post-war years. So America retreated from its world role, and so did Russia, because it was more interested in rebuilding itself after a murderous civil war uh, than, than in fomenting world revolution, even though it did continue to 
foster various revolutionary uh, forces in various parts of the world. So uh, the geopolitical confrontation was no longer there. The geopolitical considerations involving Russia would come to center stage in the mid-1930s. After Japan began its expansion in East Asia and after Hitler came to power in Germany. So now it was a whole new ballgame. The fact that Russia was ruled by the Communist Party was objectionable, but thanks to the rule of the Communist Party, Russia restored itself as a major player on the global scene. You see, for uh, various governments in various parts of the world, the problem with chaos in Russia has always been regarded as a very, very serious issue, a danger on a global scale. Whenever Russia is in order, in one piece, the situation in Eurasia tends to be more stable. Whenever Russia explodes in another revolution, all kinds of horror scenarios begin to, uh, to appear. So uh, the uh, interest in keeping Russia stable has reappeared in the American discourse uh, on foreign policy, generation in and generation out. So, and, and that, from the point of view of geopolitics, that's uh, how it should be. Because the implications of deep Russian disorder are much too problematic for everyone to consider. So, in 1933, United States uh, restores, moves to restore a di a diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. And the common interest is preparing for the likely uh, conflict with the challenging powers uh, of, of the period, uh, uh, Germany and Europe and, and Japan uh, in East Asia. So uh, they uh, not only restore their diplomatic relations when the war does begin, not immediately, but a few years later, the two countries become allies. And that alliance, and people kind of tend to overlook the importance of that alliance. If the United States and the Soviet Union had not managed to put their differences aside uh, and, uh, and form a, a strong military alliance, it's very likely that Hitler and his allies might have won the Second World War. It was not a given that they would have lost. And there were people in the West who thought that it actually would be a good idea to let Hitler win because he is such a big anti-communist and also because he wanted to destroy Russia. Destroy and enslave Russia. In Hitler's plan, there was no place for Russia as a state. Doesn't matter whether it's communist, non-communist. Destruction of Russia as a state. By the way, uh, Winston Churchill, who in the, during uh, the Russian Civil War strongly advocated large-scale invasion of Russia uh, in order to overthrow the Bolsheviks because they were such dangerous people. By 1936, he was on the floor of the parliament urging the government to start thinking about an alliance with Russia to contain the real threat presented by Hitler. <laughs> so much for the dialectics of ideology and, uh, uh, and geopolitics. So uh, we defeated Hitler. What did we do at the end? At the end, we created something like a new world order. So the next attempt, just as the first attempt of the First World War, uh, the second attempt was focused on the same set of ideas, namely making the world more peaceful, preventing or containing conflicts, uh, strengthening international law, uh, uh, adhering to the principles of democracy, uh, human rights, uh, right of nations to self-determination, and so on and so forth. When that first uh, edition of New World Order was proposed by Wilson, Russia was not at the table, because Russia as a state almost did not exist. It was engulfed in this bloody civil war. In 1945, when Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin uh, sat at the same table at the altar and hammered out the uh, uh, fundamentals of not just the terms of ending the war, but also on creating some important foundations of the world order. They were on the same page. And that is very interesting because, I mean, how could, how could uh, Roosevelt and Churchill have been so bloody naive as to accept Stalin at uh, Stalin's promises at face value? Of course, he, he, that was just tactics for him because he was interested in global revolution and you couldn't trust Stalin. And, 
there's a whole literature on the subject which presents Franklin, Roosevelt, and, and Winston Churchill as idiots who were taken for a ride by the wily Georgian uh, who somehow charmed them into signing all those wonderful agreements. No, everybody knew. I mean, those were hard-boiled realists. They knew about the world much more than the writers of some of those books. <laughs> they were dealing with a world which was without an order, a world shaken to its foundations and, and <laughs> washed in blood on a scale which had not been seen by humanity ever. And they were trying to, pr to create a world order which would be enforceable and manageable, and that meant that uh, that world order was, uh, had to, to tolerate diversity, including ideological diversity, but at the same time it would have to adhere to norms of international law. And also the foundations of realpolitik, power balances, were also to be included, even if not in, in, in written form, but at least it was implied that there would be some kind of a balance of power. So this is how we entered the Cold War. The Cold War was about East-West struggle, but that struggle in the post-war period would be waged within the framework of an imperfect but still existing world order. And what's more, the logic of that competition between East and West would be contributing to the rise and the to the development of a world order. The most interesting and I think the most persuasive uh, uh, evidence of that logic is in the nuclear arms race. Okay, they build nuclear weapons. Why do they build them? Well, they're bigger and bigger, better weapons. They give you muscle to put pressure on the other guy, and if need be, to fight and win war. And then, when this nuclear arms race moves into its uh, second decade, at the end of its second decade, uh, both sides discover that they cannot fight and win nuclear war. They discover that they have to talk to each other about minimizing the risks of a nuclear, because they recognize that they're in conflict, they're in competition, and they have all those nukes. And there are people on both sides who say, well, if we have those nukes, we, will, we should use them. In the late 1950s, there were uh, two particularly interesting individuals who thought that the big East-West struggle between capitalism and communism can and should be resolved with nuclear weapons. On the American side, there was General Curtis LeMay, old Iron Pants LeMay, as they called him, uh, who was the chair of the Strategic Air Command. He, was, uh, he couldn't understand what, what the pussyfooting politicians were waiting for. You know, while the Americans had a huge preponderance in nuclear weapons of the Soviet Union, sure enough, on the other side of the spectrum, there was Mao Zedong, who was putting tremendous pressure on Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader not to be afraid of nuclear war and, and just, you know, go full swing. You know I mean? they will destroy the source of all evil, the American empire. And uh, uh, that would be the end of, oh, of course, hundreds of millions of people would die, but then the rest of them would live happily uh, ever after. I mean, of course, they had no idea. The most stunning thing about those debates is that they had no idea of the ecological consequences of nuclear war. They were not factoring it in. When President Kennedy became president, he requested detailed plans for waging nuclear war. The generals were not particularly happy with the request because General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, never actually looked into the detail. So for the first time, the commander in chief was able to see the detailed plan, standard integration, integrated operational plan, CEOP. When he looked at it, he was aghast and he asked, I think it was LeMay, because he was in charge of the nukes, he asked him how many people were likely to die after this massive unleashing of nuclear fighting power on the Soviet Union and its allies. He said, well, between 500 and 600 million people, give or take a few hundred. Not just in Russia and China, but also in countries around Russia and China. And Kennedy was shocked by it, because he plainly thought that there was nothing that could justify that kind of mega murder. He was very competitive. He was intent, fully intent on winning the Cold War, winning it ideologically, winning it for democracy, for the West, against totalitarianism and communism, uh, in uh, being able to appeal to the uh, energies of the rising global south, which was fighting to free itself from colonialism. Uh, but he was not ready to, uh, to see this mega murder as, as the price of the conflict. And neither were they on the Soviet side. Mao Zedong never got what he wanted uh, from, uh, from Khrushchev. 
And in 1963, following the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had the first step in the creation of what we now call the architecture of nuclear arms control. In 63, the three countries, the three nuclear powers at the time, uh, the Soviet Union, the United States, and Great Britain signed an agreement which uh, banned the testing of nuclear weapons anywhere except underground. Uh, and that was uh, an important step because at the time they were testing like crazy and they were gumming up the atmosphere and, and uh, it, was, it became a, an important public issue. So for me, it's an interesting demonstration of how the logic of confrontation inexorably leads to the need to negotiate and create instruments for cooperation. In fact, what's happened, if you examine uh, the history of U.S.-Russian relations, there has to be a bad crisis for the countries to be jolted into trying to work out another arrangement, another cooperative arrangement. First, they have to go to you know, heightened tensions and uh, uh, the dangerous uh, jockeying for position, and then they discover that, hey, actually, you know, there are better ways. And then they reel back and they negotiate and they, and they come to an agreement. This is how we kept the peace during the Cold War. So the Cold War is actually, uh, it has many interesting aspects. On the one hand, there was the U.S.-Soviet rivalry. There were the two superpowers who were competing for world power and influence. There were two grand alliances facing each other off, NATO and Warsaw Pact. Millions of troops on both sides, preparing for a war which they knew would be the end of the world. I mean, the, the military on both sides knew only too well that once they were to engage in a, in a serious fighting, like World War II uh, level fighting, even without nuclear weapons, Europe would be obliterated, it would have become unlivable. So they were a little philosophical about it. Uh, the, but but they, they were, their jobs was to stand there and be ready for war. By the way, both sides, both sides had strategies which were predicated not on them striking, striking first, but the other side striking first. But we now know from the documents that neither side had plans for striking first. That's interesting. Imagine you know, a very tense relationship, very armed relationship, where both sides know that they're not going to strike first. And so they build up the, their arsenals and they say, yeah, okay, I'll hit you if you strike first. I'll hit you if you strike first. But I'm not going to be <laughs> So at some point, sanity had to be introduced into this, this kind of game. And it was introduced. In the 1980s, we saw the climbing down from this confrontation, drastic reductions in both nuclear and uh, uh, conventional forces and so on. So, but still, uh, think of those confrontations the arms race, the threat of nuclear war, local wars, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. I remember observing uh, the goings-on in Vietnam. Uh, I was a student at the time, and frankly, I was convinced that the Vietnamese didn't have a chance because they were confronted by the full power of the United States military. And how come? How could the United States have possibly lost that war? And yet it lost it because that war was actually a sideshow to a much bigger project of developing an international order. And it was a big blunder when the United States chose not to recognize the new government in Vietnam, even though it was led by communist Ho Chi Minh and his party in 1945, which was desperate to be recognized by the United States. They didn't want to be a Soviet or Chinese puppet, but their fate was to be uh, suppressed by the French because the interests of European rebuilding Europe and warding off the communist threat in Europe dictated that Washington does not support the loss of the French colonial empire. So the French were allowed to come back to, <laughs> to Vietnam and, and start suppressing the nationalists, uh, the communists who were the nationalists and, and so on and so forth. So when that logic was uh, critically addressed in the United States, domestic dialogue in the 1960s and 1970s, it proved to be quite, quite possible to, to not only withdraw from Vietnam, but then heal the wounds and then prepare better for the struggle for, uh, for a better world order. Or China, which was bad communist China for a long period of time, until Richard Nixon discussed, discovered that if he sheds ideology and treats the situation in Eurasia from the point of view of geopolitics, then 
forming a triangular relationship between the United States, China, and Russia might actually be a better deal for the United States. If you can maneuver around the growing split between China and Russia, then you could be actually helping yourself quite a bit. And by the way, that triangle is still there. And uh, its uh, geometry keeps changing, as everything in this world. But it's very interesting. You know, uh, 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 Nixon used a China card to make the Soviet Union more pliable in negotiations, and that worked. And then when the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991, uh, the Chinese leadership began to maneuver in uh, various ways vis-a-vis -vis the United States, and one of the Chinese leaders famously said in the late 90s, you use the China card against the Russians, we'll now be using the Russian card against you. And the Russians are using the China card against the Americans. But just watch what's going on. But it's interesting how that triangle, it's as if there is something in the nature of things for the size of the triangle be equal. Whenever one of the sides begins to, to shrink, it might be good for the guys who are on the shrinking, uh, on the ends of the shrinking part. But the guy who is out there at <laughs> a great distance from both sides, that's not a nice position to be in. But anyway, uh, also think of the period of the Cold War as a period of unprecedented and sustained economic growth, resulted in, resulting in drastic improvement of living conditions, at least in the developed world. Uh, and by the way, both on the eastern and western side of the great ideological divide, because both in state socialist countries and in, in, in the democratic capitalist countries, we saw drastic improvements and the creation of the welfare state and so on and so forth. The colonial empires dis, uh, were dissolved. They came crashing down, uh, liberating the majority of humanity from, uh, from the yoke under which they lived before. That was, a, that was great progress, not to mention a scientific and technological revolution and uh, globalization, which has bound the destinies of nations together more tightly than ever before, for better or for worse. So, Let's think of the United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War as being competitive stewards of that world order. We should be thankful to them for keeping their rivalry in check, for moving to create a relatively safe mechanism of arms control, and for continuing to negotiate. Because both sides, uh, I mean, whenever, whatever differences between them, might have been. They had fundamental shared interests in survival, peace, security, and so on and so forth. They disagreed and they fought on a lot of issues, but the fundamentals were never touched. As a result, we have survived and we have moved on. And in fact, what is more symbolic of the strange character of the Cold War, if not the remarkable success of President Reagan and General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev in the second half of the 1980s in negotiating an end to a Cold War. Nobody expected that. Nobody thought it was possible. In 1983, President Reagan, speaking to a, an evangelical, ev evangelical conference, famously called Russia the focus of all evil in the modern world. And then he uh, kind of expanded on that, showing that these are, these are people they are just terrible. You can't do any business with them because they will deceive, they will lie, they'll do anything. They, terrible people. Five years later, the same president is basking in the May sun in the middle of the Kremlin. And uh, uh, Gorbachev uh, is uh, introducing kids, say, meet grandfather Reagan. And, then, <laughs> and, and uh, CBS News, <laughs> Dan Rather, <laughs> sticks a microphone into the president and says, Mr. President, you're in the middle of the evil empire. And then he smiles, he's sunny, he's smiling, oh, that's already gone, that's a past era. <laughs> How could you so quickly navigate from, from the evil empire to a new age where we're all friends and doing business together and so on and so forth? Well, because, because the confrontation was always only part of the picture. And uh, as a result of a number of historical forces and brilliant leadership coming mostly from Russia, let's admit it, Gorbachev played a more important role in bringing the Cold War to a conclusion because it was not just about US-Russian relations. Gorbachev recognized and acted upon that recognition, the profound crisis of state socialism. What looked like a promising experiment for the future of mankind by the end of the 20th century turned into a demonstration of some 
fundamental crisis of the system. So he moved to address the, that crisis on terms which were not only understandable but acceptable to the West. You need some form of market economy, right? You can't rely on state ownership and state planning. You need some form of democracy because unless the media is free and uh, people are free to choose their governments and so on and so forth, it's not, your political system is not going to be effective. Okay, and, and, you, and you need to uh, accept the fact that the world is united and, and address the issues in cooperation with others to make that world safe, and particularly safe from nuclear, the danger of nuclear war. So we saw the end of the Cold War, but how do we conceptualize the end of the Cold War now? I'd like to uh, quote here from somebody I actually happen to know personally because he was ambassador, United States, Reagan's ambassador to Moscow, and I remember a number of conversations, uh, a few of them were, which were friendly, I must say, because uh, we rarely agreed on, on anything. Uh, I didn't particularly like that individual, but, but he became a key policymaker under Reagan, and uh, especially because uh, I didn't particularly like him, I take delight in quoting from his recent article in the Washington Post. <laughs> A failure to appreciate how the Cold War ended has had a profound impact on Russian and Western attitudes and helps explain what we are seeing now. The common assumption that the West forced the collapse of the Soviet Union and thus won the Cold War is wrong. Now let me repeat. The common assumption that the West forced the collapse of the Soviet Union and thus won the Cold War is wrong. Sounds strange? Uh, the fact is that the Cold War ended by negotiation to the advantage of both sides. And that's how it ended. Because it ended a few years before the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, of course, those events were connected. But it's important to remember that both sides were seen as winners. They were no losers at the negotiating table that proclaimed proudly and happily to the world that that the Cold War was over. And the fact that you can't, could not imagine a more ideologically polarized pair of statesmen than Ronald Reagan, who made his whole career on militant and hardline anti-communism, and Gorbachev, who was at the time the most influential member of the Communist Party of anywhere in the world. So the ideological differences uh, were not that important. What was important was that they acted upon their common interest and, and the common interests of mankind, but the important thing was that the Soviet Union, which was changing in ways which were acceptable and understandable and supportable by the West, was something that the Russians did not to please the West, but because they thought democratization, the market economy, demilitarization was in the interests of the Russian people, of the Soviet people. That was the only way out from the systemic crisis of the Soviet system. So that is an important thing. To, it wasn't because, you know, the Russians were kind of pinned into the corner and then they said, okay, we will have competitive elections now because Reagan is threatening us nuclear war. Come on, I grew up dreaming of competitive elections since the time I was 16 because it was always ridiculous to to go to the ballot box, you know, on, on another Soviet election where there would be just one candidate for the job. <laughs> you know, I, when we had our first competitive election, parliamentary, in 1989, I took my son to the ballot box, to the ballot place, right? And he was 10 years old. And he was too bored to go, but I persuaded him. So together we get into the booth and, and there's a list of candidates for the first time in my life. <laughs> and I tell him, Vasya, this is a special moment. Yeah? You know, we now have to choose, uh, and uh, let's choose this guy. And the guy's name was Boris Yeltsin, by the way, who was running. <laughs> over. I said, because he, he is the best of them all. I said, oh, okay. I said, okay, I don't mind. Yeah, okay, we then marked that you know, name, then, then dropped the ballot uh, in, into the box, and then we walk out, and I'm terribly excited. I say, Vasya, you've just taken part in something historic. He said, Dad, what's so historic about that? I said, well, you vote in an election when there's a choice between candidates. He said, Dad, how can there be an election without a choice? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I felt like 
my whole life had been wasted for me. <laughs> and he just takes it for granted. I mean, Zemajit, do you understand how many things had to change before we came to this point? It's important to keep in mind that the collapse of communist regimes in Eastern Europe and then the overthrow of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union and then the dissolution of the Soviet Union as a federation of 15 republics took place after the Cold War ended. And uh, the result, uh, it, it, it was, the processes were connected with each other, but, but, it was not a clear-cut case of one side winning and the other side losing. You might say, yes, capitalism won over communism, right? But when you begin to deconstruct it, these mega terms, you will discover that it's not that simple. You can also make a case that, which, by the way, the case that was made by uh, George Soros, one of the most famous capitalists of them all. A few years ago, he published an interesting book, which was called The Capitalist Threat in which he made a case that now that communism is no longer uh, in the role that it played in the Cold War, kind of uh, competing with capitalism, capitalism is in danger from itself. That's what he meant by saying the capitalist threat. So for capitalism to be more healthy, you have to have an alternative. You have to have some kind of ideological competition you have to have systemic competition that actually helps, helps uh, maintain capitalism in a better condition. So if you can say that uh, it, was, it was a great uh, victory for one side and a loss for the other side, that raises some questions. And also, if the Russians took this initiative in dismantling the old system and then dismantling the Soviet Union as a federation, which resulted in the drastic reduction of Russia's international power and influence. If they did all that, did they do it because they were frightened? Did they do it because they were kind of throwing in the towel? No, they did it because they thought that this kind of a policy turn was best for Russia. And in some respects it was true, in other respects it was a big mistake. Because the transition to capitalism in Russia turned out to be catastrophic. How can it be otherwise when you lose half of your economy in a matter of two or three years? When inflation jumps up to the level of four digits a year. Imagine what's like living through that kind of a crisis. That's like double the, the, the big whammy of the Great Depression that the Americans experienced. And also Russia was now stuck when the Soviet Union, see, there was a country with centralized government, federal government, and with government of 15 republics, units of the federation called the Soviet Union. So when that structure is dissolved by the decision of some of the republic leaders, the restoration of the basic functions of government in each of the republics is an enormously complicated job. By the way, when we are examining the continuing crisis in Ukraine, which is a failed state by any definition. We should think of the Russian revolutions, dissolution of the Soviet Union in 91, or the collapse of the Russian Empire in 1917. Overthrowing a government can be an easy thing. But then living through the chaos and trying to rebuild some kind of a state usually takes years. And sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you lose a state as a result of the inability to restore the political structures which are the basic underpinnings of, of any society worthy of the name. So, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the overthrow of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the Soviet government was actually a result of a failed competition between opposing factions without the Soviet Union. So there were reformers there, there were hardliners, and would have been better for everyone if those two factions had not had maintained some sort of a civilized competition and then democratically the Soviet Union might have achieved a different kind of a result. Instead, they went at each other in a zero-sum game and the Soviet Union had to be dissolved. So it was, it was a failure of policy making, it was a failure of leadership, it was, and it was a tragedy. For peoples living in the Soviet Union, it was a tragedy. They lost a lot, they gained something as a result, but 
it, we have to really maintain, uh, to, to recognize that it was not a simple case, okay, they were defeated in the Cold War, so any attempt of people living in the post-Soviet space to cooperate and create some sort of international organizations is bad by definition, that's revisionism, that means, that means returning to the Cold War. Uh, so uh, the post-Cold War period, starting with 1991, the post-Cold War, the post-Soviet period, uh, has, it can be neatly divided into two stages. The first stage, from uh, 1991 to roughly year 2000. Russia was going through this catastrophic transformation. What was the American role then? The United States, for the first time in the history of relations between the two states, became deeply involved in transforming Russia, deeply involved in counseling, guiding economic reforms, political reforms, and even foreign policy. In terms of foreign policy, in that decade, Russia accepted the leadership of the United States. Sometimes they would differ, sometimes they would fume uh, against some American actions, but the fundamentals were, listen, the U.S. is now the only superpower remaining and our best bet because of the domestic difficulties and so on and so forth, because of economic troubles, we shouldn't challenge the United States. Okay? So, on the one hand, the West was trying to help the transformation. On the other hand, the West, as could be expected, was taking advantage of the vacuum of power that emerged in Eurasia with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Nature abhors vacuum. Yes, the US government and the German government did promise Gorbachev in 1990 when the question was whether the Germans East and West should be allowed to reunite, that NATO would not move an inch from the borders of the time. Uh, it's an interesting discourse. There was no document signed, it was just oral uh, promise. And uh, uh, whenever uh, the issue crops up again and, and the Russians begin to charge that the Americans violated yet another promise, they promised not to expand NATO eastward, and they did. The response is always, but look, there were so many countries between you guys and Western Europe who felt insecure, so they were asking, we were not imposing NATO on, on those people, we, they needed security, uh, and, and they, they were concerned, and so NATO was open, and at some point, you know, one after another, they all became members of NATO. What's more, you Russians can also become members of NATO if you want, under some conditions, sometime in the future, but we don't know when that's going to happen. So the expansion of NATO eastward was happening in a kind of a non-confrontational, semi-friendly fashion. But I will never forget a conversation which uh, I had in Brussels at NATO headquarters in 1997. I was uh, uh, a member of a group of Canadian academics who uh, came there for, to see how NATO works. We spent a week there, saw a lot of interesting things, including the inside of an AWACS plan, a plane. Uh, we didn't fly, we just you know, passed through. But there was this briefing on NATO enlargement, which was conducted by a British general and an American general. And the British guy was the first, and he was typical Polish, uh, Polished, uh, uh, British uh, aristocrat, who gave us a wonderful, wonderful picture of how NATO's expansion eastward was making everyone happier and secure and so on and so forth. And then came the turn of the American general. He was not as well, not as polished as the British uh, counterpart, but he, he went through the routines of explaining how expansion worked and then he said something that few people expected from him. He said, you know, I may be simple-minded, simple but I have a problem with this constant uh, expansion of NATO because, you know, as a soldier, I, my, I'm thinking, don't kick the Russians when they're down. Because they will get back on their feet, and they won't forget. And we kind of looked at each other and said, this guy, is a Russian spy there or something? <laughs> no, he was, he was a decorated American general in his mid-50s, and uh, he just spoke his mind. Uh, because power politics and geopolitics cannot be uh, cancel out of existence just because we want to do so. And the balances of power have been the fundamental 
tectonic plates of the political planet on which we live. And so, yes, if the balance of power changes drastically again one against one important country, that it is to be expected that at some point that country will begin to push back. It's in the nature of international politics. Now, if the new balance of power, which gives that particular country a lessened role in world affairs, uh, is objectionable to those who, I mean, if, if the, the, the new balance of power is in the interest of the other participants, then the other participants would try and prevent the changes from taking place. And if, if Russia has begun its pushback, as it has uh, in recent years, it didn't happen now in the Ukraine, it's been happening for several years now, if Russia decided to somewhat change the balance of power in Eurasia in its favor because the uh, reduced status, the reduced influence that it had was creating problems and insecurities in Russia. We have to accept it as part of the way the world works. Just that we have to accept it that the United States and the Europeans would be somewhat concerned about that and would be trying to prevent it. So what we are witnessing now is a renewed geopolitical competition where uh, everybody understands that it's in the nature of things and everybody kind of plays by the rules which are familiar and everybody of course presents their own side in the best possible light while bashing the other side as being the violator of international order or mortal change to the global security and so on and so forth. Been there, done that. <laughs> so the issue is whether these changes in the balance of power, regional balance of power, global balance of power should necessarily lead to big conflicts or whether they can be contained within a framework which is flexible enough and where the, the terms of those changes can be negotiated. An even bigger and more important change in the global balance of power is occurring in Asia because China is likely to become the world's leading economy and uh, the new containment of, of China in some form is already part of the official policy of the United States. Does this mean that at some point the United States would be prepared to obliterate China uh, with nuclear weapons just to remove the threat, much as Mao Zedong was advocating in the late 1950s? No, it doesn't follow. It doesn't follow because changes in power balances within the country and on the global scale happen all the time. Putin is associated with the resurgence of Russia. If you look at the stats for rates of economic growth, political stability, uh, standard of living, uh, the incomes, pensions, and so on and so forth, and compare Russia of the 1990s to the Russia of the past uh, decade and a half, the contrasts are stark. So Russia has really been resurgent in some respects. It's still a country which has enormous issues, enormous flaws and weaknesses and so on and so forth. And what's more, uh, this resurgence, which is to a large degree attributable to, to the fact that Russia has restored something like a functioning state at the price of abandoning partially liberal democratic principles, which were proclaimed as the founding principles of the new Russia back in the early 1990s. So for the Russians, it's, it's a, a very uh, important dilemma. Putin's style of governance helps Russia uh, overcome its uh, past chaos and strengthen its state. But at what price? Is that price acceptable? Is that price too high? Can we change the terms in the next election so as we protect the fragile democratic institutions from further erosions under the pressure of authoritarian rulers. These are the questions which the Russians are dealing with. They're complex questions. And political culture jumps to the fray because you can so easily persuade the Russians to forget for maybe another generation about liberal democratic principles if the survival of the nation is at stake. So this complex of insecurity that exists in the mind of every Russian, almost at the level of your spinal cord, and as a Russian, I'm familiar with it. Russia without a state is a tragedy writ large across 11 time zones of Eurasia. 
And by the way, I would like to repeat the point. It, it, I think that it can be taken as a given that massive destabilization of Russia is regarded the world over as a global problem, portent with, uh, pregnant with all kinds of bad scenarios. So uh, that's why, by the way, Putin's authoritarianism was plain, obvious for everyone to see from day one. And yet, uh, there was this remarkable cooperation and even friendship between the likes of George Bush, for instance, very interested in promotion of democracy by various means, and, uh, and Vladimir Putin, who was jailing some uh, billionaires uh, who challenged to him politically, and so on and so forth. Situation in U.S.-Russian relations presented us uh, with, uh, in the past few years, when President Obama began his first term, was an attempt to rationalize uh, and improve relations between the two countries, which would accept the fact that Russia is no longer a basket case, Russia is resurgent, and Russia is probably entitled to some increase in its international influence. And we saw under the rubric of the reset, as it was called, uh, some very, very serious progress in relations between Russia and the United States. And it continued all the way to uh, 2012, and then uh, the inevitable, as it has happened before, every time it moves in the direction of better relations, things begin to come to the fore, which divide the two countries, and new issues appear. So what were the divisive issues? What are the divisive issues now? Divisive issues, if you will. Number one. Russia is determined to pursue the reintegration of the post-Soviet space, meaning the countries which once were republics of the Soviet Union. Russia is doing this by appealing to the economic and power interests in those neighboring states and offering them terms of trade and economic integration, which some of them find hard to refuse. This is what the reintegration of the post-Soviet space is. Now, the security agenda is also there. So cultivating a deeper integration is expected to become the post-Soviet neighborhood safer for Russia, safer from, for instance, uh, further expansion of NATO. Second thing, the United States openly supports opposition forces in Russia. And it's consistent with the idea of promoting and helping, rev helping revolutions in various places. Middle East is uh, a case in point. The, the Arab awakening was enthusiastically uh, met uh, uh, in the United States. And, and in fact, uh, there was this enthusiasm about the overthrow of authoritarian regimes and the people's power uh, that follows. So, but in the case of Russia, there was uh, an open siding of the United States with the forces that were against Mr. Putin's return to the presidency in 2012. It came to a point where Vice President Biden supposedly directly told Mr. Putin, Vladimir, we don't think it would be a good idea for you to run for the president again. If, if I had been advising President Biden, uh, Vice President Biden, that would be the first thing that I would have advised him not to do. And he's <laughs> notorious for saying things which sometimes are politically incorrect, as we know. But I mean, having heard that from your American friend, the first thing that you do, yes, I will run for president. <laughs> the, and that's sort of the typical Russian response. You don't tell us what we should do with, with our government and so on and so forth. That's the, the kind of the mental construct that uh, uh, arises at this point. The third point is that Russia has been growing more and more insecure about the military balance between Russia and the West. And that balance is not in favor of Russia. And in fact, with the new military technologies coming to the fore, new forms, and new types of weapons, new forms of war making, which are on the horizon or are already here, Russia feels that its investment in its security must be renewed. So they've started a process of military modernization. They still spend one-tenth of what the Americans are spending. And every time I look at the statistics and see that the United States spends 10 times as much as the Russians, my question is, is America 10 times as insecure as Russia? <laughs> Russia has 13 neighbors more than any other country. When the Russians look east, they see the friendly Chinese faces. But when they count the number of faces, 
on their side of the border and on the Chinese side of the border, they get a bit uneasy. Also, when they say weapons to China, and the Chinese are quick to copy and then mass produce the same weapons under different names, well, they are friends. They are friendly neighbors, and they cooperate in a lot of things, including keeping the United States at bay, if it works. Uh, but, but the thing is, uh, with NATO expanding from the West, with China there rapidly rising in its international influence, and with a huge Muslim world being not just on the southern border of Russia, but with the being part of Russia, because there are 20% of the population of Russia are culturally, or in full terms, in terms of religion, Muslims. So Russia is part and parcel of the Muslim world. It's not isolated from it. So when you think, of, and also the unfreezing Arctic, which poses huge issues in terms of the regimes of shipping, access to the uh, hydrocarbon resources on the seabed, access to the fisheries, and so on and so forth. And Russia has more uh, territory in the Arctic than any other country. So you would think that with the, this kind of an environment, the huge Russian state would be spending a little more on things connected with defense. Uh, than just one tenth of the United States, which uh, and you know how many bases Russia has uh, outside, uh, you know, international foreign bases in foreign foreign soil. That's about 15. The United States has more than 500. But of course, their roles are not the same. The American role is to maintain a certain international order. Russia is not in the business of global governance. Russia can be. Uh, a partner in the global partner uh, governance project together with the Russians, or, or it can be a challenge to that order, but it's not on the same level. And by the way, it never has been. And that's something that we should keep in mind. Even though the two superpowers were seemingly equals in terms of influence in the world, they never were. The United States always com had commanding heights. The Russians were always in the position of challengers. In fact, uh, it's useful with some degree of uh, uh, simplifica oversimplification to compare relations in the global order, relations between the Soviet Union representing revolutionary forces, socialism and so on, and the United States representing the world of capitalism, to labor relations and General Motors, a relation between the management and the unions, where they can, they can fight over the terms of the contract, and each side is prepared to go far in pushing for their interests, but at the end of the day, they must be in the business of making cars. So to keep the world going and moving forward, as it did during the Cold War, was a joint concern of both superpowers, even though their roles were not, were not equal. The Ukrainian crisis is a culmination of a number of trends which have been brewing in the post-Soviet space. Number one, the Ukrainian crisis is a crisis of transition. Ukraine is now a failed state because its, its leaders have failed to steer the country away from the collapsed structures of so state socialism to some form of viable democratic capitalism, which they regarded as a realistic and desirable goal. The coup d'etat or the revolution, let's call it, you know, the, every coup can be a revolution if the guys who came power by coup managed to stay in power, <laughs> all right? Wh which is, uh, they've been in power since uh, uh, February the 22nd or 23rd. So, well, the more time passes, uh, the more it looks like a revolution. And besides, what started as a nationalist uprising in the capital of Ukraine, in the city of Kiev, has now spread far and wide to other regions of Ukraine where Ukrainian nationalism is seen as a mortal threat. And so the revolution is continuing in other forms, just as it did in the Soviet Union in 1991 when the central authority collapsed, just as it, as it happened in the Russian Empire in, in 1917 when the Tsar abdicated and left utter chaos in the way. So there is the domestic crisis in Ukraine. And that's the most dangerous thing because that's a big state with 42 million people. And it sits, sits at the intersection of the geopolitical interests of Europe and Russia. And uh, the collapse of the Ukrainian state in the course of this revolution is a threat which is seen as such 
both in Washington and in Brussels and in Berlin and in Moscow. But there's another reality to the Ukrainian crisis, and that is the competition between Russia and the West for control, for power and influence in Eastern Europe. And Ukraine is regarded as absolutely vital both by the Russians and by the West. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, has kind of impressed it upon on a whole generation of policymakers in the United States that this datum that a Russia without Ukraine is safe because it will never be an empire, but a Russia with Ukraine is by definition an empire. I've never had a chance to debate this with uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. I know him personally, but I haven't seen him since the Cold War. So. Uh, but the thing is that, that, I mean, if we're serious about that, we can have a nice little discussion to test the viability of that proposition. But yet that proposition is now accepted at face value as almost part of New Testament now. So, you know, we should never allow Ukraine to fall under the influence of Russia because, you know, then the world order will collapse. And the Russians say, we well, should never allow Ukraine to become uh, firmly integrated with the West because then, you know, the NATO tanks will be within five hour drive from Moscow. And, and that's absolutely unacceptable for us. Because if it continues to widen as it is now, nobody knows how it will end. You know, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was the most dangerous moment in the Cold War, both sides knew what the end game would be. I mean, right from the beginning, they could imagine the terms of the end game. Not so on Ukraine. Because Ukraine is out of control. Uh, in the Obama administration, they may have one scenario uh, as to the end game in Ukraine. In Moscow, they may have another scenario, and they are partly compatible, partly, not entirely, and they're talking about other terms. But try to sell it to the Ukrainians. And that is the most uh, uh, damning part of it all, because there's chaos there. Chaos in the government, chaos in the provinces, chaos in the army. It's a failed state. So a real test of U.S.-Russian relations at this point is whether we are capable of mustering our sense of common interests and address the problems of this very tragic stage in the development of Ukrainian statehood in such a way as to help the Ukrainians sort it out without civil war, without partition, without the country collapsing fully. Uh, and when I think about the uh, possibilities, uh, again, I invoke the whole history of the Cold War. And I say, yeah, we've been through crises like this. It's been worse quite a few times. So maybe we'll manage to do it again. And on the big issue, and that has to do with you know, rise and decline of states, is the perceived decline of the West, which is uh, manifested in the troubles of the European Union, the fiscal crisis in the United States, the weakening uh, of the ability of the West to control world affairs. Is that trend, as well as the trend of Russia increasing its influence in Eurasia, are they incompatible? Or is this perhaps part of a rebalancing that the whole world needs to help the world order to evolve in a more rational and balanced direction so that uh, nobody would, would feel threatened or insecure and the possibilities of mutually beneficial cooperation in, in the global interest would be enhanced. So this is a question, it's not a theoretical question, and again, when I'm in my optimistic mood, I can offer 25 reasons why it is possible, uh, but when I'm in my pessimistic mood, I'm, I can just shudder at the implications of where it then can go. In the Cold War, we never were sure that we would survive. Some of us thought that we were doomed to die <laughs> because of the nature of this confrontation. So today, the situation is not that dire as it was in the Cold War, and we're not as divided. The one ideological divide that there is, by the way, and that's a new thing, uh, or kind of a uh, 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 trip back to the 19th century. Ideologically, Russia today is to the right of the United States. That's why somebody like Pat Buchanan is just in love with Vladimir Putin and his politics. Because <laughs> about family values, you know, uh, limiting gay rights, uh, and so on, nationalism, and so on and so forth. I mean, there is something that's happened. In the 20th century, Russia was uh, sim simply uh, in simply terms positioned to the left because it was 
challenging capitalism from the socialist perspective, right? So capitalism on the right. In the 19th century, Russia was on the right. It was an evil empire which was opposed to the ideas of French Revolution, democracy, and so on. All the crowd of Europe could depend on, on, on Russia to come to their aid if uh, they were threatened by another revolution. Which is another interesting thing, how history comes back and those pendulum swings are observed. So, fundamentally, uh, I think that we, we should, in times like this, be mindful of the fact that uh, the Russia and the United States have a special relationship in terms of the impact of that relationship on the benefits, on, on the future of the world and the well-being of the world. And, uh, you know, uh, as part of sanction exchange, the space agencies of Russia and the United States in recent weeks have traded some threats. Some projects have been discontinued, but the International Space Station is still there. So some <laughs> official in Moscow proposed that, hey, why don't we have, uh, wh why don't we tell the Americans that we will no longer be allowing them to use our spaceships to take their astronauts to the International Space Station? Because in the absence of the Russian transportation, you can't get there, or you can't return from up there. <laughs> Immediately, there was an out outcry uh, of protest from the Russian space agents. Are you nuts? I mean, the space station depends on close cooperation between the Russians and the Americans, because you know what? It consists of two parts, one Russian, one American. And most of the power resources, power sources, are on the American side. So if you isolate the Russian part from the American, the Russians would see the, <laughs> the lights dim, <laughs> the computers kind of begin to malfunction. But, guess, uh, take this, the steering engines are on the Russian side. <laughs> so, the Americans, if the Russians declare, you know, an embargo <laughs> on the Americans, the power, now, if, if both sides go at it, so the, uh, you, you have a loss of power, and you have a loss of control of the space station, which means that it may actually fall down. Some of you who have watched uh, Gravity movie uh, know what, what would be the result. So, I think that it's a perfect emblem of the world of our planet, where the two sides cannot afford to go too far up the, uh, the staircase of confrontation, and uh, there are too many shared interests uh, between the two countries, but more importantly, of the world at large, where these two countries continue to play a special role, uh, for them to, uh, to be able to weather this particular storm. Uh, but then again, uh, you never know. Blunders can be made. Statesmen make mistakes. Countries are drawn into situations where they never thought they would be, especially when you're dealing with a failed state of Ukraine. In the old days, uh, much of the territory of the Ukraine, I'm talking about the Middle Ages, you know how that, uh, that part, how that territory was called? The wild field. The place where peace-loving, humble folks would never go, because it's wild. And there's no, there are no borders there, and it's just uh, all kinds of desperate men looking for fortune, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, today it's not so much a wild field, but it's really a, a country in great turmoil, and uh, uh, the challenge is to us all to help them weather the storm.